A very warm welcome to the World Economic Forum Deutsche Welle debate from Ho Chi Minh City. I'm Amrita Chima. We have a very interesting panel for you here today. We'll be looking at partnerships for sustainability and asking whether this is going to be the year of the Green Tigers. Now, South Korea has taken a leading role in trying to fight climate change. They've set up an ambitious agenda and they're also chairing the um, G20 summit this year. And we're very pleased to have, we have Minister Yong Sun Jun from uh, South Korea. He's the Deputy Minister for Environment. Now, Vietnam is not just hosting us here in Ho Chi Minh City, but it's also chairing ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and has also pledged to make climate change a major issue, not just in the region, but also internationally. And we're very pleased to have the Deputy Minister for Environment and Mineral Resources, Ngun Thai Lai. Now, apart from these two policy voices on my left and right, we also have three voices from the corporate world, voices which are very strong on sustainable development. We start with a company which is one of the biggest German investors in Vietnam. That's Metro. Franz Müller is here with us. He's a member of the management board as well as a co-chair of the World Economic Forum East Asia 2010. Welcome, Franz. Thank you. Now to a company whose founder invented the light bulb. We have here Stuart Dean. He's the president of General Electric ASEAN. Welcome, Stuart. Thank you, Amrita. And finally to a company which began as a company which dealt with explosives and then went on 100 years ago to work on chemicals, we have the president of DuPont Asia Pacific, Carl Lukács. Welcome to all of you. <laughs> Now, um, despite the somewhat mixed results we had at Copenhagen last year, climate change, sustainable development, and green growth have become central to any discussion about econ economic models around the world. There's a great push worldwide to have more sustainable growth, and also in Asia. Several countries already in Asia are leading in this area. A lot needs to be done in terms of uh, government regulatory pra practice, more openness. And pre Do you encounter a lot of what we could call green tape when you're trying to kind of you know, do business with governments in this region? I think one of the areas that uh, really needs to be addressed early on is the area of subsidies for fossil fuels, right? Um, I would say you know, at least half the countries in Asia still have subsidies for fossil fuel, uh, which then run through the entire system, affect ele electricity pricing. Uh, and we, we recognize that there's uh, socioeconomic groups that benefit from those subsidies. Uh, but I think it's also clear there are better ways to do income redistribution than subsidizing everyone's use of fossil fuels. But right? Stuart, electricity, gas, water, they are basic needs. And for large parts of the population in this region, that is something that they are hugely reliant on, on these subsidies. How does one reconcile that? At one level, you want electricity and fossil fuels to be more efficient. At the same time, you've got to guarantee your people electricity, gas, and water. Well, there's no doubt you need availability of those. But not everyone needs it at below cost. Right, and I think that's the real lesson. I think the EU, is, the EU has been a leader in green technologies because they've priced traditional fossil fuels not only at the real cost, but above the real cost, which has spurred innovation and incentives uh, throughout the EU. When you subsidize fossil fuels, people abuse the system, right? You get people driving Mercedes, driving on, the, on less than the cost, actual That's cost a of gas. Thin, a thin right. layer. But, but the point is, uh, in order to get the right behaviors, yeah. uh, you need to price fossil fuels at market prices and find other ways to do income redistribution. 
in Germany, France, for example, people who use renewable energy are often given tax breaks to encourage them to use more green technology. But why is it that, that still at this stage, renewable energy remains so expensive? Wind power is twice the price of coal power. Um, solar energy is five times the price sometimes in some areas compared to normal coal power. Why is it taking so long for the energy sector to come up with uh, technology which would make it much cheaper to offer renewable energy and you wouldn't have the kind of subsidies that Stuart is talking about? We are very much looking at normal market mechanisms to run energy prices. And as long as we subsidize and artificially uh, subsidize, we will have this problem longer than we want. So as soon as the market mechanisms come in, I think we'll be um, negatively, negatively surprised how fast energy prices will go up and how fast new technologies, including green, including wind, including solar, including geothermic technologies, have a very uh, affordable payback. And we see this already out now with measurements we take in some of the stores, uh, where 10 years ago you could not think about these kind of investments because mm. it will not pay off and uh, it's a short-term view. Mm. Uh, we have now a very long-term view of how running our business, mm. not only economically but also our responsibility to, towards mm. a long-term view company and society. And the second thing is we see much shorter paybacks because energy prices go up and we have to look for alternative solutions. Mm. And what is also the case is that these technologies also offer us lower unit costs and this will come and we saw this dramatically go, uh, going on in the last five years uh, and this will increase this will even become better so uh, we have to be a little bit patient a mm -hmm. little, little bit patient, patient but this will come that we have normal economical market mechanisms with affordable prices now um deputy Mr. you now, what in your experience, what form should a public-private partnership take from your experience in South Korea? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, the public partnership is very crucial in achieving uh, economic uh, green economy as well. Uh, and then uh, there are many uh, examples, you know. Uh, I'd like to just uh, give one uh, example, introduce one example. Uh, because there are too many uh, uh, green technologies, you know, mm -hmm. which one is, we have to confirm which one is real, which one is fake. Mm -hmm. And then in that case, uh, we need, uh, for example, uh, green uh, certification system, for example. And then uh, uh, in Korea, we, have to, we are now operating that kind of system. And then it could uh, qual it identify, qualify the green technology, green uh, company, you know. By doing so, we can remove the uncertainty. And then uh, second, once it is designated as a green company, uh, it can get uh, many uh, uh, benefits from government, for example, tax or loans and any other uh, priority in uh, R&D investment. And then uh, important thing is to, uh, it is uh, connected to uh, commercialization so that uh, we can uh, create uh, uh, to modern uh, green uh, the market, you know. Now, Carl, would you agree with this? There is a cost of growing green. This, we've been talking about energy and subsidies and so on right now. Do you think Asian companies, Asian governments are in a position to absorb the initial cost required to use green technology for long-term gain? Can they absorb the kind of financial losses that they might initially have? Well, I, I, I'm not a, a, a banker or an economist, but I like very much what the deputy minister said, that we don't have a choice, that this is the direction we have to go. I think the, the, the limiting factor right now is the science, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm so encouraging the promotion of R&D. These problems will be solved with science, not with financing. They'll be helped with financing, uh, not with uh, any other promotional uh, arrangements. Uh, it, it, to take solar right now, I mean, we're at, you know, the industry's averaging 15% current uh, con conversion efficiency on silicon-based modules right now. We have dreams at DuPont of over 50%, and we're working in the, in the research labs in that direction. Uh, thin film solar voltaics that, that uh, you know, can be enhancing and broadening the applications beyond just the, the, the thick film modules. So it's going to come from science. 
Right, thank you, Vijay. I mean, science has its limitations, but also, obviously, great opportunities. Now, Vietnam, we've seen, uh, they say in Germany, every second garden chair in Germany comes from the Mekong Delta, and yet, Vietnam imports 80% of its timber because of deforestation, and your government is working very hard to change that. Do you think Vietnam's government is doing enough to deal with the problems that the country is facing? The Mekong Delta, this is a Vietnam rice bowl, and we are very much dependent on the uh, water resources from the Mekong River. And uh, with the impact of uh, climate change as well rise, so the most critical problem for Vietnam, not in the far future, at present also happening, that's the water shortage. Uh, and also the uh, water pollution. And uh, we uh, have to uh, work with our neighboring country to ensure that we have enough water for our sustainable development. And in our recent legislation, all the activity taking place in upstream have to ensure the environmental flow for downstream. Uh, to uh, uh, sustain the livelihood of the people uh, downstream. Basically, from what I've uh, researched, suggests that you're trying to increase your forested land by 40%, 42% within the next couple of years through a whole series of measures. Thank you very much for that. Now, I wanted to ask you, Stuart, how important do you think public pressure is going to be as a driver of change towards sustainable growth? I think it's going to be huge, right? Uh, you see already, uh, you know, particularly in uh, places like Indonesia, which has decentralized local populations care about what's going on in their communities, right? If their forests are being depleted, uh, you know, they're, they're screaming loud and the governments are, are responding. So I, I think that's a positive development. Um, if I could also uh, come back to your, your question before, you know, about the need for governments to invest and, and do they have the resources to do it. I think Vietnam is a, is a great example of a country that, that is doing it the right way. Uh, every country should look at its own natural resources and its advantages. Vietnam is blessed with both hydro and wind, uh, which they can develop very inexpensively uh, relative to other technologies. I think every country needs to look at its own natural advantages and how it can leverage those uh, to go green at very effective prices. And that's a very important point because South Korea has found its own model on how it wants to have a low carbon green growth economy. What are you doing in your country, uh, Deputy Minister, to raise consciousness among the people on the need for green growth? I can uh, give you three uh, examples in, in Korean cases. You know? uh, one is uh, Green Start Movement. We call it a uh, Green Start Movement. It is the nationwide campaign uh, we have to change our lifestyle into uh, green, you know. And the second is uh, carbon, uh, carbon uh, point system. When the household reduce uh, carbon energy saving, you know, at the time they can get uh, incentives in the form of cash or uh, coupon. And then three, uh, third is, is the uh, labeling system, you know, carbon labeling. It can provide information how much carbon dioxide has been uh, emitted during in the course of production, transportation, and uh, disposal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, incentives is very important rather than the mandatory uh, uh, regulation. Mm -hmm. I think, and then uh, public awareness is very important. Now, um, Francis, if I can ask you, now, Asia finds itself in a bit of a dilemma at the moment. At one level, it's being viewed as the engine for economic growth, and at the same time, doesn't that put a lot of pressure on Asian economies, particularly East Asian economies, in terms of re resources, on their, and domestic consumption is increasing, there's more waste. And that becomes a double-edged sword. How does one reconcile that? At one level, you have high growth. At another level, that kind of puts more pressure here on resources. Good. Um, I fully recognize that specific challenge, mm -hmm. but um, 
if I compare that situation with the situation in Europe, then I'd rather come from a growth perspective and solve the problems then, mm -hmm. than I'd have, uh, then I'd have a very stagnant economy. Mm -hmm. So, um, coming from the positive thing mm -hmm. that we have an economic growth, um, I think Asia has not only a challenge, but also in this respect, an enormous chance. Mm -hmm. And um, talking about technology, um, what do you see? You see that more and more international companies put their R&D centers to Asia and, and also specifically to China, Korea and Japan. That a lot of technologies which is now a production uh, strength of Asia are linked to also green tech technologies. So I think uh, there are interfaces possible. Uh, there are a lot of uh, opportunities between the IT sector in Asia, which is very strong, and green tech technology as especially. So there are a lot of opportunities also that the green challenge will also bring, bring green technology growth to industries in Asia. Does not answer your question completely, because um, yes, growth will bring also those challenges for the environment. And we cannot expect now that uh, companies who are picking up the growth and picking up the wealth also in Asia, uh, that they have at the same time in their mind also to think about green tomorrow. So, uh, and that's why I think a lot of governments working now on these kind of things and a lot of governments make enormous progress in the mindset of people to manage growth and, and consciousness of how, how to deal with this. Uh, and I think also the private sector and international companies who, are, who also have life cycle experience from other markets can bring in their knowledge and can share this with, uh, with companies in Asia, with governments in Asia, with partners and consumers in Asia to make this combination that you grow in a safe way. You know, all of you are emphasizing at your various levels how important innovation and research and development is in developing green growth and developing green technologies. Carl, uh, all of you companies, DuPont, Metro, as well as GE, come from companies which have huge budgets for uh, research and development and innovation. How difficult is it, in your experience, you're all based in this region, um, for smaller companies with smaller and tighter budgets to invest in these kind of new technologies? I think that R&D globally is becoming much more open. Open collaborations are, are very much in vogue now. Uh, and as we all realize that that's a way to speed up the output. It's inherently risky. We say at DuPont, fail fast. We have thousands of projects under evaluation, fail fast. The longer it takes, the deeper the hole. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I very much look forward to and do collaborate with science institutes here in East Asia. Uh, Franz mentioned R&D facilities in Asia. We have large facilities in Asia and they're growing uh, as we uh, aim to provide, uh, not bringing Western products to East Asia, but tailoring them to the specific needs here in Asia. And as I was mentioning earlier, the, the real goal is that generation skipping technology products where we can avoid the mistakes of the previous generation in terms of products with environmental impacts. For all of you, um, sustainable development is a key element of your core strategy in the past few decades. How important is that for your branding and for enhancing the reputation of your companies in this world? I th uh, you know, it's turned out to be huge, but let me tell you, when, uh, when we introduced eco-imagination, we were very concerned that people were going to start questioning GE's, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to get an adequate return for our <laughs> shareholders. Uh, and, and so we pitched eco-imagination initially as, it's green for green, right? <laughs> you know, we were promising everybody we would make money at, at green. But I. You know, you talked about public awareness before. You know, as public awareness has increased, the greening of GE has, has been our, our best possible branding that we've ever had. We used to be criticized, why did you ever uh, give up your theme line? You know, we make life better every day. Uh, frankly, I've forgotten what the tagline was, but uh, you know, we're, we're a green company and that is a great space uh, to be in today. If I could just come back to, the, to uh, how uh, smaller SME companies can play. You know, lo local problems require local answers, right? Um, so it, every country's got its own unique situation, and big global R&D facilities don't focus on local problems, right? Uh, one of the great opportunities is coal is going to 
play you know, a big part of power generation for you know, the next 25 years, whether we like it or not. So the question is, how can you green coal, or at least clean it up, right? And you know, we've discovered some great technologies being developed in Asia uh, by medium-sized companies that can, uh, that can gasify the coal and significantly reduce emissions. Great, on that very optimistic note, should we uh, throw um, questions open to the floor? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Christy Lee. I'm from URI Investment South Korea. I would like to thank all the panelists for such a comprehensive and thought-provoking um, presentations. Uh, we've been discussing a lot about how important uh, it is the sustainability and how vulnerable especially the ASEAN countries are for the environmental change. My question goes to the leaders from the corporate sector. I would like to um, ask you, um, what are some of the collaboration and partnerships that can ASEAN government can do in order to facilitate uh, the technological enhancement, um, also uh, to facilitate this process of sustainable uh, green economic development? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Thank you very much. That's a very relevant question here. Uh, I'll pick on agricultural products as, as an example. Short answer, I would love to see the ASEAN countries collaborate on product approval process. We have years and years of toxicology tests and scientific data that all of the countries, if they collaborated and leveraged that data, could greatly speed up approval of, uh, of crop protection chemicals and products that greatly enhance output with a smaller environmental footprint uh, and seeds as well, se higher yielding seeds uh, for corn, soybean, and rice in Asia that, uh, that can get to the market faster. So that's just one, one specific example. Franz, do you want to add something to that? Um, I would um, answer this question a little bit from a different angle and also to have a complimentary answer uh, to my colleague here. Um, what can Asian cooperation bring uh, here uh, to make progress? I think one element is that if you look at, uh, at ASEAN and opportunities as a market, uh, as a market which is not only a national market but a cross-border market, that if you enlarge the market space and the market place as such and you can reduce inefficiencies and then I talk about more free trade between those countries, then you automatically generate value which you can also bring in in the total value chain, for example, to finance these kind of new technologies. And I think in the end, uh, we limit ourselves, and also Europe is uh, there not without a blame, we, we limit ourselves in free trade and have inefficient systems in that whole trade sector in the total value chain where we also destroy value. And if you open up these kind of things within ASEAN to have a much more open environment between the countries, we automatically open up value also to finance these kind of things on new technology. So come a little bit from a different angle, uh, how, to, how to get an, uh, a more efficient market mechanism between the countries in collaboration. And perhaps a brief comment from you, uh, Stu. Uh, uh, there's enormous uh, potential for mm -hmm. green PPPs, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, I go back to... Uh, some of the experience we've had in Indonesia where we work with both local Indonesian companies as well as city administrations mm. to tap this un, un, unused amount of methane gas and the equivalent CO2 that comes off of them. It's a win-win for everybody. You get basically for a one-year payback, you're taking and preventing deadly methane gas from escaping into the atmosphere and generating, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 or more megawatts of electricity that you don't have to generate from traditional fossil fuel. Those kind of partnerships work. They work in, they work in wind mm -hmm. and uh, many other technologies as well. The gentleman there, right in the front, if you can get the microphone to him. One of the challenges that I see in sustainability is that in, in many entrepreneurial environments and other things like that, people are focused on growth first and then only after they've achieved scale do they start focusing on efficiency and sustainability. How do you start to change that mindset and get sustainability and efficiency and those pieces kind of built in from the beginning so that people aren't building large sources of future problems before they start to solve them? So uh, the Asian countries should cooperate uh, uh, more closely, and then we have to share uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, our experience and knowledge, <clears throat> particularly in green technology. Uh, and then 
uh, in the case, in, in that sense, Korea actually uh, is uh, uh, contributing the uh, $200 million for East Asia uh, partnership. And then it, it is not enough uh, for his uh, question. Uh, I think regarding the uh, carbon dioxide uh, you know, for the, uh, to reduce in the, in the uh, steel company, uh, we have very big uh, uh, company in Korea, POSCO. Uh, it is uh, uh, number one, almost number one uh, factory. They are investing a lot of uh, uh, money to reduce uh, carbon dioxide and uh, make it uh, more sustainable. So I would like to recommend uh, to, com uh, to uh, uh, confirm that uh, strategy of the company. We've talked a lot about uh, sustainable partnerships uh, and what's very clear is everyone here on the panel and the wider audience recognizes the urgency of the situation. And from what I've been hearing and listening uh, to your commitment to uh, sustainable development, I think uh, Asia is poised at a very critical time. There Opportunities for green development within Asia are immense. The next few years, I think, are going to be extremely exciting to see whether Asia actually takes leadership in low-carbon green growth. I'd like to thank all my panelists for an interesting and stimulating debate. I want to thank all of you for being here. You were watching the World Economic Forum Deutsche Welle debate coming to you from Ho Chi Minh City. Thank you.